what we're seeing here is that God disperses the nations and gives them up to all the sons of God. He dispersed them according to the number of the sons of God, the people who are in heaven, and he allows them to rule those nations. And that's one of the reasons why you don't necessarily see it as wrong for other nations to be serving other gods, because that is their territory. That's, God, that's their God's domain. That's their God's territory. God gave them that power. That's also one of the reasons of how we know that God is the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's able to disperse the nations and he's able to allot an inheritance to all the other sons of gods, right? The lower gods. And this is their domain. And in the first, in Genesis 1, I, I was talking about how, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars, they are host of heaven. They are, it seems as though they are actual beings. And one of the reasons that supports this is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, and it, it mirrors verses 32, but it reads, and do this, and Moses is talking to the Israelites in, in this, but he says, and do this so that you will not lift your eyes towards heaven and observe the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of heaven, and be led astray and bow down to them and serve them, Things that Yahweh, your God, has allowed it to allotted to all the peoples under all the heavens. But Yahweh has taken you and bought you out of the furnace of iron from Egypt to be a people of inheritance to him as it is this day. So the other people have been given up to praise these lesser beings, the sons of God, because that's where their heart desired. And he just gives up. And he just allows them to go after their heart's desires, right? And they're praising these lesser beings. And one of the things that we end up seeing, and I didn't put it in the slide, is in Psalm 82, you're actually seeing an instance as to where God is judging these, these gods. If you want, as a matter of fact, because it is, it is pretty interesting, um, I'm going to go to Psalm 82 real quick. Just so you can see, uh, it, it's pretty obvious that it's a, you know, it's a divine council. God divided these nations among these other gods. And, and then this is their judgment in Psalm 82. And it reads, God is taking his place in a divine, con divine council in the midst of what? In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And this is what God says. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So now this, in Psalm 82, is now what we're going to see is God is going to be issuing in. Now all the nations that was dispersed in, in Genesis 11 is now issuing them back into his fold. At this point, the nation of Israel is established. God's people is established. And the purpose for the nation of Israel is to help God spread his goodness to the ends of the earth. It's the same job that Adam and Eve were supposed to have. It's the same job that everybody is supposed to have. Abraham has. God is attempting as his image bearers because we bear his image. We are supposed to share his glory to the ends of the earth. Right. That, that's our job. And that's the reason. OK, I'm going to take it. The Israelites. These are a people who have been afflicted. These are people who have been oppressed. These are people who have been slaves. They are not wanted by anybody. And watch me take these people and make them kings and rulers and just by following my word. And if other nations see that if you just follow my word, these, this is the life that you're able to live, the protection and the abundance that you're able to have, then they would willingly come and follow the word of God. Because what you're seeing in all the chapters before in Genesis 11 is, okay, they might receive the word of God. They might even see God, but they rebel against God. But maybe if I speak to them and I choose a people from which they can see and they understand, 
then they will willingly make the choice to be in communion with God. He gives them up to these nations, but they're judging all these nations wrong. They're, they're not showing justice to the weak and the fatherless. They're not maintaining the right of the afflicted and the destitute. They're not rescuing the weak and the needy. They're not delivering them out the hand of the wicked. These gods are allowing wicked things to happen. Therefore, God judges them. And now he's going to save all the nations. And we see the saving of all the nations later on after we get to Jesus. And, and we get that in uh, what we're going to see now in the book of Acts. You're starting to see this parallel. This is the reason why Genesis 11 is very important. Because in Genesis 11, God confuses the language. He disperses the nations, right? And then in Acts 2, you see the reverse of that. And God unifies the language. In Acts 2, this is after Jesus has ascended onto heaven. And he tells the disciples to wait for, I'm going to send my helper, the Holy Spirit, out to you to help them prophesy, to help them speak and spread the gospel, to spread the good news, right? And this, the day of Pentecost is the day where the Holy Spirit comes upon all the apostles. And in verse five, verse, uh, verses 5 through 11 in Acts chapter 2, it reads, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Don't they all speak one language, right? How do we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Alamedes, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and uh, Cappadocia and Potnus and Asia and Phrygia and Philanthia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. This is the amazing thing is that in Genesis 11, he confuses the language, right? Because they're coming together to sin even better. And after God defeats sin, he unifies the language to spread the good news. Uh, that's amazing to me. And you, so you're seeing the reversal and also you're seeing the fulfillment now of Psalm 82 of God inheriting all the nations, Anybody who comes, no matter your language, you would hear the good news of God. And that's the purpose. So now when you go home, no matter what language you speak, you are able to profess the good news of God. And after this event, thousands upon thousands of people were baptized and they were saved and they went out and they preached the good news of Jesus Christ.